What's up, everybody? And welcome into our first episode of our brand new podcast series that we have titled Trial by Media, Fair or Foul. And we are going to go through everybody's different competing rights that judges have to balance in determining how much access the public should have through the media with cameras, microphones, interviews, and all the sorts to see whether or not anybody's right to a fair trial is prejudiced or affected in any way, positively or negatively throughout the process. And each week we are going to be handling a different um, situation of someone's rights, right? We're going to go through the defendant's Sixth Amendment right to a fair trial. That's going to be episode one because we believe it is, in fact, the most important right to be balanced in this entire situation. But we're also going to talk about prosecutors' rights, the public's rights, the media's rights, witnesses' rights, jurors' rights, the judges' rights, and how all of that comes together to create what is, in fact, a fair trial, which a judge is the gatekeeper to try and maintain that fairness and uh, make sure they preserve that fairness for the defendant to not create any appellate issues. So again, today we are specifically focusing on the defendant's Sixth Amendment right. And to help me, on episode one, we decided to get the partners together of the law firm. I've got Pete Sardis and George Tragos here. Both have been criminal defense attorneys for quite some time. My dad, almost 50 years, and Pete, over 20 years. Federal, state court, multi-jurisdictional, different states across the country as prosecutors for my dad and myself and a public defender for Pete. He worked there before coming here, but so much experience in the criminal defense realm to help us break this down. And I think the best way to just kind of start is what is generally a defendant's Sixth Amendment right to a fair trial, Pete? You know, I'm just going to quote her off of the Sixth Amendment itself. You've got the right to a speedy, public, impartial trial. You have the right to know the charges that have been levied against you. You have the right to be confronted by the evidence against you. You have the right to compel witnesses to show up to trial in your defense. And you have the right to assistance of counsel. That's the basic overarching rights that a defendant has in a criminal case in the United States. And dad, historically speaking, why do you think the founders felt it necessary to have this Sixth Amendment right to a fair trial for a criminal defendant in our free country of America? Well, keep in mind, first 10 amendments, the Bill of Rights, all were limiting government. So the purpose of the Sixth Amendment was to limit government. And in order to limit government, you have to protect the rights of the individuals in trial so that government can't take advantage of them, can't throw them in jail. So when, when uh, James Madison wrote these first 10, that was his idea. Protect the individual from the government. And I think it's really important to come into this discussion with that context because there are people that will say after this episode that we're too defense leaning. When we do the prosecutor episode, they're going to say we're too prosecutor leaning. When we're doing the media episode, they're going to be, oh, we're too nice to the media. Because when we do each one of these, we're really going to bring it from a perspective of how do we fight for that right to a fair trial? And this one being the Sixth Amendment for a criminal defendant specifically in place to keep the government from just being able to railroad you and basically write your name down and say, we think you did it. Therefore, you're going to prison for the rest of your life. We're going to get the death penalty. Right. And part of the protection that's put in place there is the media to potentially promote a fair trial, right. but that can work both ways, right? Hence the name fair or foul. So Pete, what does some of the case law say and where criminal defendants argue that this was not a fair trial? Where is that bar? What are some of the factual arguments that make something an unfair trial for a criminal defendant? What it comes down to is from a defendant's perspective, a trial is unfair. If it's somehow the proceedings somehow affect, you know, the judge, the prosecutor, or the witnesses and the jurors' ability to evaluate the relevant evidence against that specific defendant. So if one of those things goes askew, then you know the, the defendant's always going to cry foul and say, "Look, this wasn't fair to me for one of these reasons. You know, either my lawyer didn't do his job right, the judge did something wrong, the prosecutor did something inappropriate. You know, the witnesses either they lied or they made up evidence, or the evidence is inconsistent." And of course, the jury just got it wrong. Those are pretty much the tenets. And dad, specifically with some facts, maybe some cases you have, and, and we're not bringing the media into it just yet. Just generally speaking, what have you found that has actually been determined by appellate courts or you have argued in criminal appeals that made a trial fundamentally unfair for your criminal defendant client? 
Well, uh, first we have ineffective assistance of counsel where the lawyer did not do a good enough job of representing the defendant and it was so bad that it affected the verdict. Uh, the other is limiting of cross-examination where the judge said, no, you can't ask the witness that question or you can't get that information so that you cannot seek the truth uh, by cross-examining that witness. Okay. Um, I, I think there are a lot of others that we've seen too, right? Where right. law enforcement oversteps the lines or doesn't produce some kind of discovery or does something funny with the discovery or destroys evidence, whatever it may be. That can create an issue, obviously, for it not being a fair trial for the defendant and balancing whether or not what's happening throughout these proceedings are really fair. A judge can be biased against a defendant. Judges get recused or removed from cases. Mm -hmm. Same thing with a the prosecutor. There's prosecutorial misconduct. They're overzealous. Um, there maybe are elements that make them biased against the type of person, whether it's because they're, uh, you know, the, the olden days prosecuting Confederate soldiers or terrorists or, or alleged terrorists um, and, and cases nowadays where there may be some kind of bias. Obviously, you would think everybody has some kind of a bias against terrorists and, and things like that, but that can create issues that make the trial fundamentally unfair for a defendant or a runaway jury. If, you know, you've seen the movie and there are jurors that just want to get onto juries to make sure that this is a guilty verdict because something had happened to their child in the past. And so they want to make sure that anybody accused of this gets convicted. So all of those things can create situations where a trial is fundamentally unfair. Now, as we bring the media into it, and now that we have a reference of the point of the Sixth Amendment and what an unfair trial looks like, what are some ways that in me the media attention specifically can create issues that defendants can cry foul, Pete? Let me just start by saying the media has a tendency to have polarizing effects. So you can, you'll find that, for example, especially with witnesses and lawyers, when there's a media in the courtroom, one of two things happens. Either it makes them very conscious about what they're doing because they recognize the whole world or the county is watching them, or they turn into a little bit more flamboyant than they normally would be because at that point they're making a show out of it because they want to look good. So that's kind of one of the bad things about media. It has a tendency to cause people to act in ways they would normally not act. I think you've got some issues with potentially scaring witnesses or having witnesses putting on a show because they're more worried about how they look on the stand as opposed to the testimony they're putting out there. I think it has a very serious impact on a lot of, let me just say, lesser experienced judges because now the camera's in the courtroom, which is not something that's every day. And you might see judges either pandering on one side, again, purely for the, the spectacle of it, or you find themselves being super ultra conservative in the way that they rule, again, because they know the cameras are there and they just don't want to do anything wrong. So I think that that's one of the polarizing ways. Other than that, you can uh, the media access sometimes has a tendency, especially in today's media, where it's just instantaneous. Uh, it, it affects potential jury pools. Um, you obviously have problems. Hold on sorry. a second, because you're, yeah. you're throwing out a lot. So let's just take it piece by piece. So when we talk about judges or, I'm sorry, uh, specifically lawyers or witnesses acting differently, yeah. um, we have seen some cases, whether it's the Letitia Stock case or Lori Vallow case, where lawyers, especially criminal defense lawyers, representing people that the media has portrayed in a certain way and the public just sees as a certain way, as morally reprehensible, mothers accused of doing the unthinkable to their children, Okay. So when you have a situation like that and you know the cameras are going to be running, first off, public defenders <coughs> handle cases like this literally every single day that the media never picks up on, that the world never hears about. But when there is a lot of media attention, it seems like sometimes, and even the Chandler Halderson case, that some of these lawyers are almost apologizing in opening statements and closing arguments for representing these clients. They have also come out and said in some of these cases that it is difficult to find witnesses to testify on behalf of their defend defendants and their clients mm -hmm. because of the media attention. Dad, is that something that you think makes a trial fundamentally unfair for a criminal defendant because of the media? Well, it can. If the media attention is so great that it affects the jurors, affects the witnesses, or affects the conduct of the trial, yes. Now, a good judge can limit the amount of media, for instance, we've had situations where they would do pooling, where only one reporter was allowed actually in the courtroom, and then he went out, or one camera rather than 10 cameras, or the reporters had to sit in a separate room and watch it all by video.
but this is control of the courtroom by the judge in order to limit the impact. But it can have a tremendous impact and it can cause an unfair uh, jury, an unfair verdict because it was influenced by the media. And again, all of this comes down to what can they actually prove, right? Was the effect. So if they can actually prove that the media had that effect, then they might be on their way to proving that they were not guaranteed or given a fair trial because of the media. I think one of the absolute biggest ones, right? And we're going to take witnesses again, but now bring in potential jurors. Number one, feeling pressure to convict if the public has already convicted the criminal defendant in the trial by media and the media has already said this person did it. Here's proof that they did it. But then also because of the type of access they have, how do you keep a jury sequestered if they're able to go home? How do you keep witnesses sequestered if they're able to go home and see this stuff? And if they do see part of the trial, Pete, do you think that raises to the level of an unfair trial for a criminal defendant? See, that's a tough question. And it's going to be a matter of what did they see that uh, is that is the part of whatever they saw something that's going to affect their ability to be fair and impartial. The answer is yes. Yeah, that juror's got a problem. But here's the issue. A hundred years ago, with the reporter sitting in the, in the courtroom, you know, writing down stuff that wound up making into a newspaper six weeks from now, because that was the speed of, of the press back then. It didn't make much of a deal, but in our everyday lives, I think it's a big deal because you're talking about instantaneous media that is readily available on our cell phones, you know, at, on anywhere. You can go to lunch and watch the entire um, play by play of jury selection in any case that you see on court TV, pick, you know, pick a, uh, a an outlet. And I think it's very difficult, especially for judges to be able to balance the right of the media to be there, to make sure the proceedings are fair and they're proper as opposed to putting out so much information that they're tainting everybody before they even have a chance to be on the jury. Um, now you're talking about sequestering jurors and that's a, a technical term, meaning you're going to close them off uh, from, you know, access to the public, basically locking them in a room well, after their deliberation. That's if they're fully sequestered. I just mean yeah. every day they're admonished to not read social media, not right. read newspapers. So that that's the same thing, whether they're sequestered or not, they are told to not consume these things. So dad, mm -hmm. I think that one of the major questions is just because they see something doesn't mean it's going to be an unfair trial. I think we right. can all agree that. I think it depends yeah. on what they see. Also, as we know, as frustrating as it may seem, a juror could tell us, oh yeah, I watched the whole Netflix documentary, but I can still be fair and impartial. I don't believe what that Netflix documentary said. I'm going to put everybody on the same side and potentially not be struck for cause. Or if it happens during the trial and they say, no, 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 I can still be fair and impartial. Some judges will allow them to stay. So how do you kind of parse through what witnesses here and what jurors here that make it rise to the level? Of course, we're going to protect the record in trial, but how do we get to the level of an unfair um, trial? What do they have to say? What do they have to know? What do they have to see? Well, it starts, let me be historical for a minute. Um, the former vice president, Aaron Burr, in the first really high publicity case, everybody in the country knew he was trying to split Texas off. It was all in the papers. Everybody read it and they couldn't find a jury that hadn't read the newspaper and had, didn't know about it. And that was the first case where they said, as long as the juror can be open and fair and consider the evidence. And that's really all the jury needs to say. It is very hard, but, and people need to realize this, there are a lot of honest people who, when I'm questioning them in jury selection, will actually say, I already have an opinion. I have read it and I can't be fair. I've already made a decision that he's guilty, or I can't sit on a murder case because murder bothers me so much. I can't sit on a sexual battery case or child molestation case because it bothers me so much. You've got those honest people. The trouble is ferreting out the ones that say, I can be open and fair and honest. And yet in your mind, you know, you can tell this guy can't be open and fair and honest, but striking him for what we call cause, which means giving the judge a reason to strike him, that's very difficult if they say the right words. And I think what's what's really interesting about this process, and, and one of the things I also want to talk about on the podcast is, what are some things we can do better, right? In our American jurisprudence, and our justice system, what can we do better? And one of the things that comes to mind when we had a case, Dad, that we tried in federal court, criminal case, first ever criminal case I tried in federal court, in front of the same judge that years later, Pete and I tried a civil case. 
in the civil case, this judge who we love, she's awesome, very fair. Um, in the civil case, she did not allow us to question the jurors. We could submit questions, but she asked them all. But in the criminal case that you and I tried, Dad, not only did she question the jurors, not only were we allowed to question the jurors, but she actually allowed you to go one by one with many of the jurors because there was so much media attention on the case. Now, back then, it's like almost 10 years ago, it was mostly news articles, local news bits on this case. And one of the ways that she felt to try to fix all that media attention, again, is to let the lawyer, the lead lawyer, you and the prosecutor go through individually and ask those questions so that you could either find out, is this juror too far gone? Should they be struck for cause? Or do I believe they're too far gone as the criminal defendant that if the judge doesn't strike them for cause, I'm going to use a preemptory strike. And then if there are so many, I'm going to ask for more and I'm going to point to the media attention for a future appellate argument because we know the media is affecting these cases. So there are certain things in place that do allow us to dig in specifically with jurors when it comes to media attention. Now, I want to flip the script for a second here. What are some ways you think, Pete, that the media actually helps enforce a fair trial for a criminal defendant? I really do believe that the fact that our court system is open to the public, that absolutely promotes a better shot of a defendant getting a fair shake. I'm not saying that that gives them a better chance of beating their charges. What I'm saying is getting a fair shot at having a jury decide guilt or innocence because that openness, it really, again, the cameras in the courtroom, the judge is going to make decisions that they know are accurate because they don't want to be on the news the next day saying, what is this judge doing? Because it's going to be on the commentary of every talking head if they do something wrong. Same with prosecutors. They have a tendency to be a little bit more uh, thoughtful about what they're doing and how they, they present evidence because they recognize that people are watching every action. So I think that that's a huge reason why this country, for the most part, juries get it right. And I'm talking about criminal and civil. I think that personally, the the there are some problems, obviously, and some bad apples in the true crime sphere. Um, but I do think the more people get educated about the criminal justice system specifically, the more they get to questioning what we believe to be the norm from media or what people tell us, right? We don't just believe everything people tell us anymore as time continues on. And there are individual creators or people out there educating that have actually gone through it so they can start to understand the process more, which is important because dad, when you talk about the historical purpose of the sixth amendment in keeping the government in check, the media is a big part of that, right? And, and what do you think their role is in making sure it's a fair process. Well, keep in mind, the Constitution also protects the media. It protects the press. So there's a balance there between a free and fair media that's going to report this so that the government can't do something in secret and a fair trial for a defendant so that his jury or his witnesses aren't tainted by what the media did. So there is a balance there's a, and there's a conflict. It comes up a lot that these two purposes conflict. There's a lot of examples of that. Right. And we're going to dig in yeah. big time to the media's, you know, right. But go ahead, Pete. Can I throw in real quick? You said true crime series, and I want to make a distinction. There is a right to media as opposed to a right to entertainment. And I think a lot of the what we consider news anymore is actually entertainment. And there's, a, again, a different purpose completely. There's a much different purpose for coming in and saying, the judge did this, this witness testified in this way, as opposed to, the true crime stuff, which is the total analytics of making a trial into uh, entertainment or yeah. making it into a, a documentary, basically. Yeah. And I think that that is this kind of a good transition into, first off, we put a poll on our YouTube community page, lawyer, you know, if you want to check it out um, on how people feel the media affects a trial, do they make it more fair, less fair, or does it not affect the fairness of a trial? Any guesses as to what those percentages are? What do you think, Dad? More fair. Pete? I think less fair. So 60% said it did not affect the fairness of wow. a trial, which I thought was interesting. That's surprising. Now, of the 40% that was left, 25% said they think it makes it more fair. 15% say less fair. And these were thousands of votes, like five or 10,000 votes 
And so, so generally people think it makes it more fair or does not affect it at all for a criminal defendant, which I think as long as we're tilting towards the making it more fair, we're going in the right direction. But we've seen in the Murdoch case, in the Rittenhouse case, in the Gwyneth Paltrow case, and all these cases that have, in Johnny Depp, obviously, increasing media attention that they do cross the line. Um, and, and I'll give you a few examples of where they cross the line, Dad, and, and tell me how you think, if you were going to make an argument that this violated the defendant's Sixth Amendment right, what type of arguments they would have. In Lori Vallow, exactly what Pete said about making it entertainment. They would focus on her facial expressions, what she's wearing, her makeup, her hair. They would zoom in on her face and totally ignore everything else that's happening in the courtroom after the media argued to be there because the public has to have access to the courts. But is that access to the courts? So we'll start with that one, Dad, as our first example. No, that, that, those are meaningless um, areas for them to cover. They're not going to have an impact on the trial. I don't think those kind of things have any impact on a jury or a witness. So those are a waste of time. And they're, they're wasting media space by doing that kind of thing. And they're abusing their privilege as part of the press when they do that. And they only go to stories for people to rip apart Lori Vallow. How could she put makeup on when we know she did this to her kids before her trial? Regardless of what you think, that's not how the reporting should be. And in that case it resulted in the judge removing cameras for the trial. They only had microphones and they were released like the next day. Everything up until that point was had, had allowed cameras there. But when media crosses the line, judges do have discretion to kick them out of the courtroom. Now, people could still come in and watch. So there was still public access, but not to mass levels. So Pete, next, yeah. in the YNW Melly trial in Florida, there was an argument from his lawyers that they were putting high sensitivity microphones at council table and throughout the, the courtroom so much to the level as to pick up attorney client privileged conversations between YNW Melly and his defense lawyers. And they argued that that was violating his right to a fair trial and the media was crossing the line. What do you think about that? Absolutely. And if you look at the standard, and we're talking about the case law generally, the standard is that the media has the right under the first amendment uh, then that has to be balanced against a defendant's Sixth Amendment right to a fair trial. And when those two rights collide, the right to a defendant's, uh, the defendant's right to fair trial always wins. It always trumps. So the point where they've now placed microphones in the courtroom, which could potentially pick up attorney-client communications, or now they're picking up information that under normal circumstances, you would not expect uh, the press to be able to have access to, it's got to go. It just has to. And both of those things, like when you argue, and we're going to talk about what the uh, First Amendment right of the press and what their rights are, that is not included. Uh, folk zooming in on a defendant's face is not included. High sensitivity microphones picking up privileged conversation is not included. The, the public access to the court system is so really, I think, and you guys jump in if you disagree, I think it's really for the community and the county that the case is happening in that they should have access to it not necessarily worldwide access or even nationwide access to all of these cases. And we certainly did not contemplate the right of high sensitivity microphones, because if you were sitting in the back of a courtroom, you would never be able, well, I shouldn't say never. You would usually not be able to hear conversations between a criminal defense lawyer and his client. Right. right? So where do you kind of balance that or draw the line there? Let me, can I talk about what the case law says for a second on sure. that topic? All right. There is a case, and it's called the Press Enterprise case. Uh, actually, it's the second one. And what this case basically says is there's a balancing test. And the balancing test is called the I'm going to say experience and logic test. And the question is, on the experience side, is whatever the press wants to do, is that something that is in the court's experience to allow things to be done? Can they bring in a camera? Can they have a reporter sitting there? Is it the type of proceeding that normally would be open to the public? That's prong one. Prong two on the other side is the logic test. Is it logical that the press should have access to this information or is that going to infringe on a defendant's rights? And that's where you draw the line. So, you know, to answer the question, there comes a point where you cannot infringe on that defendant's ability to speak to his lawyer sitting next to him so you can take that information and put it out in the public eye and then potentially taint witnesses, you know, uh, taint jurors, whatever the case may be in the future. Who even cares what it taints, right? The, the, the criminal defendant's right to a privileged conversation with his lawyer is something that nobody can infringe upon. Fundamental. Yeah. 
like, I mean, I mean, that's just something that, that is an obvious, right. That when the media crosses the line, again, they got rid of those high sensitivity microphones. So the next one, dad, this was a civil case. So a little bit different, but still the rights of the parties, um, on the Gwyneth Paltrow case, not only did they have cameras, you know, zooming in on her face and things like that, the defense lawyer, her lawyer filed motions with the court that the cameras would only be in certain, in certain places. Multiple times throughout the trial, there were cameras where there weren't supposed to be multiple people in there, um, whether it was a pooled system or whatever, does that infringe on a defendant's right or a party's right to a fair trial in your opinion? Well, you'd have to prove that those items did in fact affect the verdict. And you know, yeah, you can say they were wrong. You can say they disobeyed the court order, but did they affect the verdict? Uh, odds are they didn't affect the verdict. Um, again, it's the judge who's supposed to control that courtroom. It's the judge that's supposed to control where those cameras are. You know, we're talking about all this, and these are all discretionary with the court because when they wrote the Constitution, there were no cameras. When they talked about an open courtroom, all they meant was the doors had to stay open so the public could come in and sit in the pews. That's all they were talking about. And I think that's a great point. But with that being said, constantly as we write rules, in the civil side, the, the committee I'm on and the criminal side, dad, where you're on and Pete's the federal, um, on the federal practice committee, which kind of deals with both. We are constantly updating rules mm -hmm. to keep up with society, with culture and with technology. That's a huge one. Changing the words from, you know, snail mail to now we can mm -hmm. e-serve things or e-file things. And this is just kind of another step that the courts and judges are having to interpret the laws in determining where the lines are for what media can do. And so the lines are changing. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt, but the Go lines ahead. are changing. Because when you talk about the federal side, there's a rule, it's federal, federal rule of, uh, of criminal procedure 53. And it used to say no radio uh, press could be inside of the courtroom. Well, now they've taken the word radio out and it's, you know, you can't have cameras basically inside of the courtrooms in federal court. But hold on, because now there are some judges that have been sitting there talking about how social media is affected. And the point has been, from a social media perspective, you are far less likely to interrupt or somehow adversely affect a courtroom proceeding by tweeting or by putting something on social media on your phone than you are to have, you know, a, a camera there or microphones in the courtroom. So even the definitions of media are starting to change in the federal courts. And I'll just tell you, federal courts move really slow. So just the definitions anymore are changing. Yeah. And, and sometimes it takes years to get something approved. And then we know how fast technology changes. Um, so in cases that we have had, uh, and, and then I'll talk about, so you guys talk about the cases we've actually had in our firm. I'll talk about some of the cases that we've covered on YouTube. What are some things that you have seen judges put in place or criminal defense lawyers request in order to protect the fair trial of their um, client that seems to have worked or you think would have worked better if it would have been implemented um, when it comes to cameras and microphones and media in the courtroom? Well, I think the courts, when they're looking at this, are doing two things. They want to protect the defendant, but they also want to protect the press and the, the right to have an open trial. So if they can do it, if they can design a way, and I'm thinking of one of the cases that, that we tried together, Peter, where they could have banned the press from our courtroom when an undercover agent testified. But instead of doing that, the judge found a way to let the press in there so the press could hear the testimony and protect the rights of the individual, the defendant. And what they did is they built a three-wall box around the undercover agent so the undercover agent could testify, the jury could see the undercover agent, our client could see the undercover agent, the press could not see the undercover agent, but was able to report on it. And that's the point. These judges have to balance all of this in order to protect all of the rights that are in the uh, first 10 amendments, but they normally lean toward the defendant as the primary right to protect and the press has the secondary right to protect. And again, Correct. we've got and plenty of examples I could go through like that of where they've done that. And that's what we've seen in cases like Koberger, where every time they're making a decision, they're leaning towards the defendant's Sixth Amendment rights while also trying to, to protect the freedom of the press as well. So what's interesting is we have an analogy as that case that we tried, Dad, together in the YNW Melly case, 
And I think the Peterson trial, the same actual gang uh, expert or, or cop down in South Florida testified with his face covered with a mask. So the cameras could still be in there. They could hear him. The defendant, they found that that was a enough of a confrontation for the defendant to satisfy the confrontation clause. We had that argument as to whether or not our guy could be masked. And we ended up coming up with that, you know, shielded screen system, um, which I thought was better because again, all of these rights that you hear us talking about, privileged conversations with your lawyer, the Fifth Amendment right to remain silent. If you have a microphone picking up a criminal defendant's speaking, you're violating his Fifth Amendment right because he's not waiving that to speak to his lawyer. Um, the confrontation clause, you have a right to confront these witnesses. You have the right to an unbiased jury. These are all rights of the defendant that are built into the Sixth Amendment that are really important that the media absolutely can have an effect on. Mm -hmm. What are some other things, Pete, that you've seen in our cases? I've seen, for example, when you've got sensitive witnesses, think of children, developmentally disabled people, things like that. And when the jury would make, I'm sorry, when the judge would make a decision, for example, to exclude the cameras from the courtroom or to take a child back into chambers and then have, I guess, like a, a surveillance camera. So everybody outside of the presence of the judge and the child and, and the lawyers could see what was going on but the witnesses themselves weren't affected by the media actually being physically there. And what they'll do sometimes is tell the media, for example, don't focus on the face of the child, for example, here in Florida, one of our cases. Um, go the big one is, you know, gag orders and confidentiality. We know the big gag order in Koberger's case. Um, there was a gag order in Murdoch's case. People are complaining that things are being hidden from them, uh, which again, both parties agree, especially the criminal defendant in this case, that there should be a gag order. We've had similar situations or at least where parts of cases are confidential and you can't discuss certain things, whether it's, you know, intellectual property or work product or certain background of certain witnesses where we have to sign confidentiality agreements as the lawyers. Do you think that is appropriate in this case to balance um, the factors and still giving a criminal defendant the right to a fair trial, but cutting off the media and the public from really knowing what's going on throughout the entire process? Um, there is actually case law on this okay. and the case law generally says that the right again of the defendant comes first. So ultimately if the least restrictive method, which is what's supposed to be employed to balance first amendment and sixth amendment rights, if that balancing test has to happen and if the least restrictive purpose is a gag order, then so be it. Now, if the court can do something that is less restrictive, admonishment of a witness, for example, then they should choose the least restrictive method. But the reality is, especially in today's world where media attention is from the, from like the, even the inception of a case, if, if some of these things don't, uh, don't get enforced, you'll never get a jury. You'll simply never get a jury. So another thing that, that people mention, which again, speaking of never getting a jury, I have never had this happen. I don't know if you have, um, but in the YNW Melly case, the jury was there, the whole, and we'll talk about O.J. Simpson as well, another high-profile case. The jury was there for the whole trial, got to go home to their families, but when it came time to deliberate, they were sequestered in YNW Melly. O.J. Simpson, famously, that jury was sequestered. And a lot of people in comments and discussions in the true crime world are like, why don't we just sequester the juries? That would make it so much easier, and we wouldn't have this issue with the media or social media and things like that. Hmm. I don't know if you've had it, Dad. If you have, you can talk about it. If not, talk about the problems with sequestering a jury and what a strain that would also put on the judicial system and may actually violate the, the criminal defendants um, fair trial rights. If we did sequester every jury, let's say. Well, I, I don't think people realize how tough it is to sequester a jury. Number one, you have to find rooms. You have to house them. You have feed to feed them. them. Yeah. You have to provide 27, I mean, 24 hour security, seven days a week or however long it lasts. And it has to be so around the clock. You've got guards there. Uh, they can't make phone calls with, that aren't, aren't monitored by security. They can't watch the television that's not monitored by the security. It is a huge, expensive project. Plus, keep in mind, you are restricting the freedom of a U.S. citizen when you sequester that jury. And you can only do that in the most extreme cases where a necessity is found. Because, again, you're a free citizen. You should be able to walk around uh, every day, all day. But when you sequester a jury, your freedom is limited and it's taken away. And that should only be done in the most extreme circumstances.
when I tried a one day DUI prosecution at the state attorney's office, half the jury did not want to sit there. What? Nothing. No, go ahead. Oh, half the jury did not want to sit there for one day of trial. Mm -hmm. They don't want to miss work. They had to pick up their kids from school. They had to take their medication. They had a medical appointment, legitimate reasons and illegitimate reasons. I don't want to be here. I'd rather be at home. Today's my day off. I'm not getting paid to be here. They don't want to be there for one day, knowing they get to go home to their family at five o'clock when court closes. Imagine being sequestered for weeks or months for some of these trials. When you think back to the cruise, just the penalty phase was months long. We have covered so many weeks long trial together on YouTube. They would never want to be there. And then are you actually getting a jury of a criminal defendant's peers? Or are you just getting a bunch of either retired people or people that are, you know, runaway jury types that want to make sure this person gets convicted or have some kind of vested interest in the case. And potentially you're creating an unfair jury for that criminal defendant. Mm -hmm. If you're actually sequestering every jury on every case that has any media attention. Because think about the emotional strain on that jury. And the last thing you want as a defendant is the jury being there sequestered from their friends, their family for weeks at a time for them to go back when it's time to deliberate. Like, all right, can we just call this guy guilty so we can leave now? Because that is the worst thing that can happen. You know, they're Either not making or, a decision. Or the other way, let's just call it not guilty and let's get out of here. Well, or come to a hung jury because they're like, I'm not changing no matter what. And they're thinking like, are we really going to sit here for three more days for 24 hours and try to argue right. about this when this person seems like they don't want to listen. And yeah. I think anything, any first reaction can be pushed towards the verdict or the finality. If they're sequestered in a situation, they don't need to be because naturally everybody wants to go home. Right. It's um, hard enough. If what? It's hard enough. It's hard enough getting a jury. Exactly. Exactly. Um, Okay. So uh, another situation that people have talked about with um, how to deal with this is what do you think about having different processes and procedures for the litigation of the case versus the trial? We've seen in some cases like Murdoch where there was a gag order up until the trial basically. And I mean, we got to see everything that happened in court hearings type of stuff, but we didn't get any documents or stuff like that. But then throughout the whole trial, it was, um, it was live streamed. And then Lori Vallow, we had the opposite uh, all the way up through trial, all the hearings, the documents were available, all that. Then the trial, no cameras, just microphones. Do you think that's an appropriate um, remedy for this situation? Well, like anything else, this is a case by case decision. Uh, and I, I know I've said this many times, but that's why you have judges to make these decisions, to decide which is the best way to protect the rights of the individual uh, versus the, again, freedom of the press and the public. So, you know, I, I can't tell you whether those are wrong or right, better or worse. It, it all depends on the case. Uh, I mean, there's, there's tons of high profile cases where there's no gag order at all. And people are speaking all day, uh, you know, and, and going on social media and doing interviews right in the middle of their trial. Uh, it happens over and over again. So it, it's really up to the judge. And again, the lawyers have to bring this to the judge's attention. It's their responsibility to do that as well, to bring it to the judge's attention and let the judge make a ruling. And that was a big deal in the Paltrow case. They constantly were bringing to the judge's attention that people were violating court orders and things like that. Um, so one thing I wanted to point out here before we end, and, and just so you guys can be thinking, I want to ask if you have an idea of what you think the best system would be to protect a criminal defendant's right to a fair trial, but also allow uh, media attention and public access. So I'm going to ask you each of that at the end of the podcast. But before we get to that, one thing I did want to point out for people following and trying to figure out and pontificate and project what is going to happen in these cases. In just about every case I can think of, there was at least some agreement of the parties as to what is going to happen with the cameras. Either both parties, defense and prosecution, wanted cameras out. Both of them allowed cameras in. Both of them agreed on some limitation of cameras or microphones. Or before they could even get there, the judge made a determination, like I believe in Murdoch, I believe, um, it was Judge Newman who said, I'm not going to kick cameras out of this courtroom and made it clear from the jump. So they had to figure out what a fair way was because that's just some judge's stances is that this is a public case. It's a public trial. Why would I not let cameras in my courtroom? And I think that that is kind of where we should start 
And there should be a specific reason why we need to kick the cameras out, not vice versa, like federal court, where we start with no cameras in and got to fight to get them in there to give public access to these cases. That's my feeling. But I've got some thoughts on what I think kind of a fair system would be. Pete, why don't you give us kind of an idea of what you think a fair system would be to allow media in trials like this while also protecting the defendant's Sixth Amendment right? See, to me, I think it, the fair system is a system we have because it's an individual consideration of a particular case in a particular location with a particular set of facts, that a judge and the lawyers. Because let's be honest, guys, the lawyers don't want to try these cases over and over again either. So everybody has a, you know, a, a, a fundamental need to make sure this gets done right the first time. So for me, the system is what it is, and I think it's great. There has to be right uh, to the defendant. There has to be uh, the right to the press. And that that balancing act should be done based on the individual considerations of a particular case in a particular place. You know, for example, that's why you've got your Lori Vallow and Murdoch. They made separate decisions because they're in different places with different facts. And the judge has decided, you know, in this situation, it is better to have, you know, the pretrial public publicity or not have the pretrial publicity. And I think that that's the best way to go about it. What do you think, Dad? Well, I, I think he's right, because I think I've said, you know, the, the, the judge having the discretion to make those decisions is what's best for the trial of that particular case under those particular circumstances. I do have some personal ideas uh, of trials I've had about. Well, that's, what, I'm, that's think, what I'm asking for. Like, I get it. The judge is going to make the decision. Right. Obviously, that's how the law right. is. Let right. me give you my answer to give you an idea of what I meant and what I was looking for in response. So I think the best system would be cameras are allowed in every case that the lawyers come together and agree on rules and restrictions for maybe where the cameras could be, how many cameras, where the microphones could be, what they could pick up. If there's a five second delay um, that the court potentially should control the five second delay, which that's happened in a case. I think it was the Letitia stock case. If I'm remembering correctly, where the court actually it went through their system first. And once they cleared that there was no, you know, confidential or privileged conversations, then it would go out and it would be able to be, you know, live streamed kind of like they used to do with sports on some kind of a delay. Um, and that gets formulated and reduced to writing in a court order. And then if, and again, put in there, you can't zoom in on the, the face of the defendant like they did in Paltrow. The cameras have to be set up in a way that you are watching the proceedings. The microphone is picking up the microphone at the podium. So you're picking up that, not everywhere that everybody's walking, just when things are being presented in the case. And if the judge is speaking, the camera should be on the judge. If the witness is speaking, the camera should be on the witness or the lawyer asking the questions. And just there, not on counsel table, not on the client throughout the entire case. And of course, not on the jury. And then if that is reduced to writing, there also needs to be kind of like a... Um, punitive damage section when you write a complaint. If the media violates the location of the camera, they lose that camera. If they pick up confidential conversations, they lose a microphone. If continued violations times three, they're out completely. So then nobody can complain. If it's very clear, there's a court order, we're protecting everybody's rights. And if the media crosses the line, they should be out and it's on them. And if an individual wants to come, they can still come because the doors are going to be open. Something like that, where I think it would simplify it. Now, it would take work on the front end, but only if it's a high profile case and it's necessary. But once you do that work on the front end, I think people would have a lot less complaints throughout the process and the public wouldn't seem so like, why is this not happening? Why are we doing this all of a sudden? I don't understand. Nothing's even gone wrong in the case and try to understand the process earlier on rather than waiting until later till we've watched half the case and now it goes away. Well, I mean, that's good, but we both know what it's like when you write a rule. And we both know because we've all sat on rules committees and we realize that, you know, you, you go back and forth and you make compromises. Well, this wouldn't have to be a rule. Well, it, it would have to be some policy. See, with me, what I, what I would do is I would have every courtroom with one camera at one spot, make it a, a fisheye so it can, can have the entire courtroom except for the jury. And that's the only camera. And the press can pull out of that. The court controls the camera. The court controls the sound. The court controls everything. And, you know, that's it. I, I would limit it and I wouldn't make it any broader than that. Yeah, nobody would ever agree to that because you can't see the women's <laughs> faces. You can't yeah. see what's going on in the court. And that's, they would, I think there's a pretty good argument that that is not 
equivalent to what public access would be if you did come to the courtroom. So I, I think there are arguments against that. I understand why you would say that, but even it's hard. I'll tell you. So listening to the Lori Vallow case, it was nowhere near the same feeling or understanding what it was actually like at trial compared to Johnny Depp or some of these cases where you see the judge, you see the lawyer and you see the witness and you can follow along with the trial as if you're there. But if it's just a bird's eye view or just a microphone, it's not even really worth listening to because it's so hard to follow. Sometimes you can't even tell who's talking. Is it the witness or is it the lawyer? Because you don't know what they sound like before the, mm -hmm. the trial starts. It would, it would make it neutral. And that's what I, I like. don't think it would make it. I, I yeah. think it would be akin to no access. Did you? Have I don't know. I, I, yeah, I was going to say. Now you're talking about the entertainment value. It's not as oh, no nice to watch. Be, you'd be shocked how unentertaining the Letitia talk. There was like a camera right here up at the <laughs> judge's face, a camera right on the witness's face, and then sometimes you could see a defense table or counsel table. It was not an entertaining camera view at all, but you could easily follow the case because you could see when the lawyer was talking, when the judge was talking, when the witness was talking. And if they called another witness, you could tell it wasn't just the same female voice, but you could tell it was two different females testifying now. So I think there, I think there should be some aspect of that. So you're able to follow the trial if you want to watch it and learn from it. Um, and to understand what the judicial system is like that American citizens are subject to. And, and that's an important part to how the media looks at this. And again, I think we have covered in detail, specifically the defendant's Sixth Amendment rights, how the media affects that right to a fair trial, where the lines should be drawn, comparing it to real life cases, getting some case law in there, also comparing it to some cases we've watched together on YouTube. So hopefully you guys enjoyed that. Hit the like button if you're watching on YouTube. Give us a five-star review if you're watching or if you're listening on any of your podcast channels. Let me know how you like this format. This is just the beginning. We still have to go through the prosecutor's rights, the media's rights, witnesses, jurors, judges, and everything in between. So hopefully you guys will stick with us as we go throughout this series. Until next time, that's all we've got. Thanks for watching another episode of The Lawyer You Know. If you enjoyed the episode, please hit the thumbs up and share with your friends who may be interested here on YouTube. And don't forget to subscribe. You can also follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and TikTok at Tragos Law is our handle. And don't forget to listen to the Lawyer You Know podcast featuring new episodes every week. If you have a case you want to talk to us about, if it's a personal injury case, wrongful death, catastrophic injury, car accident, or slip and fall case, please email us at lawyeryouknow at gmail.com. And of course, all these links I just mentioned are included in the description below on this episode and every episode. So until next time, this is Peter Tragos, The Lawyer You Know.